Hey everybody, welcome to Loyal Homes Podcast. My name is Tom Duell. And I'm Chris Fenton. And uh, we're here today to uh, discuss uh, a little bit about real estate. Um, Chris, first introduce yourself, a little bit about your background. Sure. So I've been a real estate agent for a while. So when I started real estate, let me, I'm going to date myself here. When I started in real estate, I created one of the first websites in in BC for personal real estate brands and I hand coded it in notepad. Do you remember those days? Oh yes, I remember those days. <laughs> and I and to really date myself, I put a little counter at the bottom. Remember those counters that used to tell you when 200 people had been to your site and it had like flames going off it. So that's how long I've been in real estate. Um, internet technology has been a big part of my career. So that's how I started. I was in my very it was really just out of high school university. And then uh, I went away to university for a while, got a, I got a Bachelor of Commerce from the University of Victoria and came back and we started the Fenton Group and um, we have had some good success. We're top 1% in the country at our company, at our brokerage nationwide. And um, I love everything to do, everything to do with real estate and I love everything to do with learning. Um, I guess that's me in a nutshell. What about you, Tom? Tom's our managing broker at the Fenton Group. Yep, I'm the managing broker here. I'm also work operations. Um, I started off in real estate about eight years ago. Um, I was hired on to be an inside sales agent. So most of my experience hasn't been um, helping people buy and sell, but helping people connect with agents and um, going through, for, from what I said, from our websites and all our lead generation, nurturing those clients and bringing them into sales. Totally. Yeah, not many people I know know more. Do you have a question about like a technical detail of real estate. Not many people I know more know more than Tom does. He's, uh, we always say he's the encyclopedia of real estate knowledge, so. Perfect, and uh, Chris has more sales experience than uh, most people that I know, so. Um, so market overview. We're kind of here to discuss where what uh, the market's kind of doing. Um, the current real estate market, uh, can you kind of um, highlight where, where it's at right now? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So the real estate market has shifted. I think everybody is aware of that at this point. Uh, we were in a really, really strong seller's market, the strongest seller's mm-hmm. market I've seen in my 20 year career for like four or five years straight. And we all know the prices skyrocketed. And about you know midway through last year, sort of late spring, things started to turn and uh, supply and demand started to balance out a little bit. So now we're in a kind of more of a balanced traditional real estate market, which is familiar to me, but unfamiliar to a lot of newer agents. Yeah, they definitely. Um, I know they, since I've been starting, the market was really starting to take off. So we haven't really had this, this change that we're seeing today. Um, definitely a lot of challenges. Um, for, from a buyer's perspective, um, a market, a balanced market, what does that really mean? And what, how does that, how does that basically, um, for a strategy, like what kind of strategy does yeah. a buyer need to, to move forward? Yeah, I mean, it means space to breathe, I think, more than anything. I mean, there's all these stories about um, buyers m- making multiple offers on homes over and over and over again and not being able to get a home, living in hotel rooms, living in RVs. I mean, every real estate agent in the province and the country has these stories of people they worked with, and it's heartbreaking. So it gives what this means is there's space. There's space to make decisions. There's space to make good decisions, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's the number one thing. There's still... It's funny, there's still good buys in the market. There's still a need to, you know, um, sometimes move quickly on a really good buy, but there's just more out there. And then there's more, a little bit more inventory. Inventory hasn't really bounced back to the levels that we used to see in 2013, 14, 15, um, but there's more options for people. So they can take time, make decisions, make good decisions. And I think that's a good thing. And then for sellers in sight. Yeah, I mean, for sellers, how does the market change for sellers? Well, I mean, I think you have to be more you more on it with your pricing. We kind of, in that really hot seller's market, we got to the point where, you know, you could kind of put a price on things. And then even if you were a little bit low, it was going to go yeah. into multiple offers and drive that price up. Yeah. That's, you know, there's still multiple offers happening, but it's it's a lot less than, than it was, a lot, lot less than it was. So for sellers, it's about being educated, which, you know, for most of my career has always been the case, mm-hmm. knowing what your house is worth using, data using comparable sales and making sure you're looking good on the market compared to everything else that's on the market. Do you, are you finding a lot of the sellers are kind of living in the past, like living what happened last year, the year before when things are really high, do you think a lot of them are still having a hard time letting go, not realizing that maybe the market has corrected a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I think that's human nature a little bit, right? People, yeah. people, uh, 
I always say that we as humans have a fundamental flaw and that we, when we're calculating our assets inside our mind, we always tend to overestimate what they're worth anyways. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, when things go up, we get with the program, when our price of our asset goes up, we kind of wrap our brain around that pretty quickly. But when it goes down, it takes a little bit more time for sure. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Any strategies for a seller in this market? Just education, right? It's, it really is about education, really understanding, get, finding a real estate professional that you, a professional that you trust that can go through information with you and show you what your property's worth mm -hmm. using data. Yeah. Like, I always say to people, you don't want me to give you a price and say, trust me. Like, let's mm -hmm. look through this and spend an hour, two hours yeah. figuring this out together so that you know what your property's worth. The power to everything is knowledge and education. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and, and you said and still need to trust in your real estate agent that, that they are providing information to help you make the best decision because it is really yeah. their decision in the end, right? 100%. And it's just there for you to guide them and show them the pros and cons of the different prices, you 100%. know, and, and hopefully they can make a decision that works best for their best interest, right? Get them a quick sale and, more, and good money in their pocket that they need. Couldn't agree more. Um, so I dealt with a lot of investors over the years, people looking to invest in uh, we've noticed that, you know, when the market kind of went crazy, those investors kind of dropped off a little bit, mm -hmm. right? So sure. opportunities for investments today, like what do you think is, what is there out there for opportunities and uh, is there any kind of strategy or, or certain types of properties that investors really should be looking out for? Yeah, I mean, I don't have to tell you this, that investment buyers, investors in real estate are very different. It's a very Absolutely. different process than somebody buying a home. When you're buying a home, you're, you're meeting your wants and your needs and you're looking for a good deal. Everyone's looking for a good deal. With investors, it's all about financials. It's all about mm -hmm. numbers. It's all about, does this make sense? So how does this market change, even from the, the slower market that you've worked in? Is mm -hmm. this The difference this time is that interest rates are 7%. Mm -hmm. The difference this time is that you can get a GIC that's returning a pretty good return on investment guaranteed. Yeah. So when people are investing in real estate, they're looking for cap rates, as you know. Yeah. And the, the, when you can get those guaranteed investments as opposed to real estate, those it changes how those financials need to look so mm -hmm. i mean there's always good investments to be made in a real estate market no matter whether it's up or down because it's all about numbers if the numbers yeah. make sense it makes sense yeah but they're fewer, fewer and farther between and you have to do your numbers a little bit better and really think it through and then of course people are having to decide or try to create a crystal ball for themselves investors and decide is this real estate market going to go down for a little bit and then go back up mm -hmm. um, or is it going to turn right around and that comes into it because a GIC is going to give you a guaranteed amount, but with a cap rate, you also get that capital gain if that property goes up in value. Yeah. So all of that factors into it. Is there any sort of specific areas or types of real estate that an investor should be really concentrating in today's market? It's a good question. I mean, that's a really good question. I think um, I think anytime you can look at undervalued locations, uh, Vancouver Island has traditionally been somewhere people invest because it sort of has that climate, as you know, that you know, our population is always growing because people want to move out west and be in the warm winters. So you can find these communities anywhere in BC, anywhere in the country. There's these pockets of communities where there's the potential for the market itself to increase. So I think those are good opportunities. You have to look through and really think it through. I'm not going to give location names because that's mm -hmm. probably not super helpful and it's a really a personal decision. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, otherwise, it's just a decision between whether you're buying larger multifamily buildings and you're mm -hmm. looking for a secure investment that's going to grow slowly over time, or you're looking at things like duplexes or even investing in single family houses and flipping them, um, different strategies for, for different folks. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I always told, told investors, you know, most of the people are looking at, you know, where they can get the, the most bang for their buck. Multiple, multiple units is usually, you know, the way to go, especially in this day when, you know, rental prices are quite comparable to you know what a mortgage is now um you know they can they can help pay for their their investment while still hopefully making some money at the end of the day uh, if they get the right right property for the right price and, and there's the so right much community. to add to this conversation like yeah. the change you know vacancy rates being what they are airbnb changes how yes. does all of this come into play that's a that's, that's a different podcast that's a whole different podcast yeah, yeah exactly there's a lot coming down the pipeline that's going to make a, a changes to the environment for especially for airbnb like you said 100%. and vacancy rates um here um, where we're from. Um, so yeah, one, one of the other things that, uh, you know, for buyers and sellers is really seasons, you know, that makes a big difference as well. Um, we're just moving into the winter season right now. So how does that affect, how did you find that affects people mindset and uh, what kind of uh, opportunities might it present? 
I love this, this question. This is one of my favorite questions because my advice is so far from common wisdom. And common wisdom, so I'm going to talk about the seasons first, then I'll talk about winter specifically, but I'll talk about the whole market. So in my experience, people believe the spring is the best time of year to sell, right? Mm -hmm. And what is the reason people think that? Uh, because, you know, they think that, you know, the flowers are coming out, the grass is green, you know, your drone photos and videos are going to look yeah. a lot better because the sun's out, um, things like that, right? So why do you think it's, do you think it's the best time to sell? Um, no, it's a lot more competition. So that's in my it. opinion. That's it. So the reason the spring is my least favorite time to sell is because sales are typically linear through the year. I won't say linear. They're linear-ish, meaning the number of sales in March is very similar to the number of sales in September. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go, it goes up a little bit in spring, but it doesn't go up a lot. But the number of listings coming on the market in spring is, there's a huge, huge curve there. So your number of competition, your, your amount of competition goes up, but the amount of buyers is, is similar. And so that is the worst time to sell. In my experience, the best time to sell is the fall. I love September because there's a there's a, a little bit of an increase in purchasing activity. So the way purchasing really works is February, it sort of really starts to pick up and it goes right through the spring, right through the summer, and then August, right? We all, mm -hmm. as real estate agents, we all know August is a slow period of time. Yes. And I think it's because people, I mean, I know what happens to me. There's all these jobs I wanted to get done that I haven't got done around the house yet. Yeah. Or there's these adventures I want to have before the weather turns. Yeah. So everybody just Absolutely. stops and goes outside. Yeah. And I always find that uh, that time of the year, you know, yeah, like you said, people are taking their vacations, yeah. um, getting ready for the kids going to school, or maybe there's a new project or different changes in work that's coming in, you know, when totally. the winter comes in. Um, so even for myself, when I'm working as an SI sales agent, dealing with a lot of buyers, this is sort of the period of time when, you know, was until about mid September it picked up again, and you're right. September to probably mid November was actually quite active. Yeah, um, Labor because, Day. Labor Day, the light yeah. switch turns back yeah, on. Absolutely, and I found that uh, people were not having to compete multiple offers, so they're getting the houses they wanted, and they're getting they feeling like they're getting the deal because they totally. weren't having to pay overprice. And uh, seems yeah, to that's be the old kind days. of a win. Yeah, yeah, that was the old days. So um, now, now they're getting a lot more discounts. It seems I see things that are selling below yeah. the asking price, um, but you know, still both the same throughout the year. I think right now, I think we're roughly seeing around that ninety. Yeah, I mean, as a buyer, as a buyer, there's there's less options in the fall, but it's yeah. it is. So so going back to sellers, so your your September, you have this push, and people want to get in before the holidays, the winter holidays. Mm -hmm. So that's why we see November slows down, right? Mm -hmm. And then again, it picks up in February. So the best times a year are to sell, in my opinion, are September, October. And then if you're doing the spring thing, if it's important, or you just have to sell that time of year, I think it's a good idea to get in before, as a seller, to get on the market before everybody else does. So like yeah. late February, yeah. early March, get your house on the market. Yeah. Be one of those new ones. Everyone's, all those buyers are waiting for this new inventory to come on the market. Be one of those early ones. Mm -hmm. um, from a buyer's perspective, Spring is a great time to buy, but you're right. It's a little bit more of a frenzy, um, mm -hmm. but you're, you have more options. So mm -hmm. I, I like that. So you're right, though. The fall team tends to be a little bit slower. So you asked me about winter specifically. So yeah. let's talk winter. about winter. Winter is, is, uh, is tricky. Now, I absolutely have I've sold a house on Christmas Day. I had a <laughs> buyer call me on Christmas Day. I was with my family, and they wanted to make an offer on this house. I've been working with them for years. This was a few years ago. And we, so it, there are, there's activity that happens throughout the year. The main thing is just to know that there is a lull from December 15th until the new year. Yeah. Like a complete, almost a complete shutdown of the market. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be hitting the market new as a seller at that point in time. Yeah. So now tips for like winter, you know, keep, make sure the house is warm, make sure that all the lights are on because it's already dark. Right. Yeah. And just do everything that we would normally say to do, Yeah. but do it more and do it better right <laughs> um yeah i mean it can it can absolutely be a good time to sell yeah perfect um the environment for you know the financial the, the, the whole country in a whole um has been changing a lot uh we've been seeing interest rates climbing at a rate that we haven't seen in a decade or more yeah. um you know people new new buyers first-time home buyers have never experienced these kind of interest rates um, even sometimes people who have already in their first home looking to upgrade have not seen these interest rates before um, how is that affecting the environment of real estate yeah i mean it's absolutely affecting the market um we, we i mean affordability let's start with affordability when interest rates go up 
then your mortgage payments go up. Yeah. You know, so we already have these historically high real estate prices and then we have these these higher interest rates. So it's affecting what people can buy. And what we're seeing in our market right now is the lower, more affordable part of the market is getting way more activity mm -hmm. than the sort of mid range. Like it's yeah. the very low part that's getting a lot of activity. And I think that's a direct result of affordability. Hmm. Interestingly, from a, you know, we're seeing bank posted rates at about 7% right now, a little bit over 7%. That's not really a, a high interest rate, traditionally speaking, or it's not mm -hmm. a crazy high interest rate, but it is in, in the last decade. Yeah. So it is for a newer generation. Yes. But every time I talk to a seasoned mortgage professional or a seasoned real estate agent, they're always reminding me, look, these are 7% is normal. Yeah. I think what's not normal, though, is you know, when last time it was 7%, a house was worth a quarter of what it's worth now. Yeah. So those loans are, are, are much, much higher. So I think I think the, the tips I have for people around this is is really simple. Talk to a really good mortgage person, a really good mortgage person that you trust yeah. and get good advice. Um, this is not my area of expertise. Find somebody whose area of expertise it truly is mm -hmm. and figure out your situation and how that looks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, market prediction. What do you think the, uh, the future holds for us and uh, what are your opinions on that? Yeah, and Tom's Tom's smiling because market <laughs> predictions are impossible, <laughs> impossible, and a bad idea. Yeah. So I, I used to in in small town British Columbia, I used to predict the market, um, and I actually, as an investor, I I predicted the market a lot and and purchased and sold homes and uh, duplexes based on on that. That all changed when COVID hit. Um, yes. So right before COVID hit, the market was starting to go down. We, we were, it was just starting, and I think the public wasn't aware of it, but we were feeling it. We, yeah. we were starting to see price reductions, yeah. and the prices were dropping. But then we know what happened. COVID hit. We all, you know, as a society, mm -hmm. I'm not owning this myself, but we all panicked and bought toilet paper. And then, <laughs> and then, we, uh, then we all panicked and started buying houses. Yes. And the most unpredictable thing in history happened, and the prices skyrocketed. And I really do believe it was a very similar fear response. I think that a whole generation of people, the millennials, who always wanted to buy homes and always yeah. believed they were going to buy homes, suddenly were faced with this, the possibility that with prices going up as quickly as they are, I may never be able to afford a home. So they moved up their purchase plans, sometimes by years. Mm -hmm. And then I think in a lot of cases, it was actually baby boomer money that was fueling this frenzy yeah. because they were using their savings to for a down payment or lending money to their their kids mm -hmm. um and everybody bought it wanted to buy a house in the next 10 years bought them one yeah. in the 18 months and, and we'll saw a huge shift on where people were moving to you know um yeah we had a lot of people because of COVID. people got used to working remotely and uh, then they basically decided that hey i can work anywhere i don't need to be downtown vancouver I'm not happy here. Totally. I want to go and have a little hobby, hobby farm totally. in a smaller rural community and still be able to do my job. And um, so we saw a lot of that. We saw a lot of that movement where people were selling their condos in Vancouver for top dollar, taking that money, moving to smaller communities on, say, Vancouver Island or maybe yeah. northern BC. And uh, we're able to put money in the bank while purchasing something that was a move up for them. And we huh. saw a lot of that. A lot of that. And for, like you said, for a lot of reasons, because people wanted to be out of the city during the pandemic. Because yeah. remember in those days, we thought the pandemic was, was maybe a little more <clears throat> intense than it turned out to be. Um, and then the, the rise of Zoom, we all were forced to work on Zoom. And yeah. we figured out that it actually works. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we saw that. And we're really in the center of that on Vancouver Island. So we're, yeah. we can really feel it because everybody Absolutely. wanted to be in space and we have space here. Mm -hmm. So I sidestepped the whole prediction. What's the market going to do? I have no idea. I, I, I made a decision not to predict the market after COVID. If I had to, if you put the screws to me, because I think you know I'm always mm -hmm. going to give my opinion, I would say here on Vancouver Island, the whole, I, I won't speak for the country or the mm -hmm. province, but here on Vancouver Island, we're probably going to see much of the same, a balanced market that mm -hmm. chugs along slowly but steadily. When that turns, whether that turns next year, the year yeah. after, or the year after that, I have no idea. Yeah, it, it being Vancouver Island, it's always a uh, place where people want to move to. Yeah. We're always in demand, right? So the, the market here is going to be different than, say, maybe northern BC or some of the interior um, and other places in Canada for sure, right? Yeah, there's, mar there's markets here in BC that are actually doing quite strong. Yes. Like on our loyalhomes.ca platform, which is province-wide real estate search site, we, we're running stats for the whole province and 
and of course, in, in my capacity as being one of the Chairman's Club Realtors at Royal LePage, I'm speaking with top agents across the country all the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. There's places in the country that are booming right now, and there's places in BC that have a very strong market right now. Yeah, absolutely. So, so is there any, uh, to remaining in this balanced market, is there any indicators of a shift that we should watch for? I always think the shifts, I always tell people, I've been saying this for 20 years, I think that if you want to, you're, you're predicting a change in market, like as a member of the general public, it's the news. I know this is crazy, but mm -hmm. when people start talking about prices going up, that's when they really start to go up. up. Like we know ahead of time, we, we realtors can feel it in our bones, mm -hmm. but it's when, when, the, when the news starts talking negatively about real estate or talking negatively mm -hmm. about interest rates, that's when you know you're in it or it's yeah. about to happen. Yeah. It was really cool. So when I was in university, I learned about uh, from this really cool guy that sat on the, I don't know what it was called, the board of directors or the, the oversight committee for the Vancouver Stock Exchange, which yeah. is where those penny stocks and stuff mm -hmm. are, are traded. Uh, so cool guy to learn from. And uh, what I learned from him was that he made the theory claim that the stock market is is um, perfectly efficient. So what perfectly efficient means <laughs> is that when you, the stock market has perfect information. Yeah. So as soon as something happens about the market or the company, <clears throat> the, mar the stock price will adjust immediately. Mm -hmm. And there's no human emotion involved. And that came about when, you know, a long time ago when they started using supercomputers to start hedging, or start, not hedging, but starting to make gains on these minute little changes in the stock market. So this was the theory we learned. What's really cool about real estate and investing in real estate is there is a, it is inefficient. The mm -hmm. market is absolutely inefficient. And it's, in my opinion, because of the emotion that we have attached to our homes. Yeah. And it's the biggest purchase in anybody's lifetime. And it's our home. Usually, right? It's your home. So yeah. you asked me earlier, if the prices drop, are, are sellers understanding that yet? And the, and the simple answer is that emotion creates a lag. And I've always thought that lag is about six months. Mm -hmm. When I know that the market's dropping, it takes about six months for it to really start dropping. Mm -hmm. And so you, if you have a network of really good real estate professionals that you trust and you talk to, you can you can get this information ahead of time, especially as a real estate investor. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And technology is making a huge play in all this too, right? Mm -hmm. moving, the technology keeps advancing every day. Uh, we got AIs now coming at us. We yeah. got uh, all these different uh, platforms like our own platform, at Lowell Homes. Um, how do you think that's impacting buyers and sellers and even investors right now? Better information. So the, the, the information isn't perfect, but it's much better information. I mean, that's yeah. the, I talked about the first website I hand coded in, in WordPad or Notepad. <laughs> and um, back then, real estate agents were, we were, um, we were salespeople, I guess, but we were people that opened doors and we were, but we were conduits of information above Absolutely. all else. Absolutely. So people would call us to find out the price of a home. Yeah. Well, obviously all of that is, is, is gone now. Mm -hmm. So people can make better decisions more quickly. And I think that that is a good thing and a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, I still think you really need to find someone that you trust that understands the industry Absolutely. to kind of help you filter that information yeah. so you better understand what it actually means. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot of misinformation or misunderstandings. Yeah, there's, yeah. I found that work, working as an inside sales agent, um, you know, because we're talking a lot of people on phone or through social media or mm. emails, um, you know, and uh, yeah, being that you said real estate agents were, you know, providing the knowledge. That's basically what we did. We provided the knowledge. We we basically gave them information that they were looking for and help move in a direction. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of misinformation out there. A lot of people don't understand how the process works from beginning to end, um, even how getting financing and stuff like that, right? So it's very important to totally. definitely connect with an agent that can help guide you. That's that's what we do. Um, and one, any, one more thing on that. Yeah. One more thing on that. Yeah. So yeah. to finish the thought, if we were conduits of information in the beginning, we are trusted advisors now. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the role of a real estate agent is to help. I mean, there's even programs in the states with technology where you can. In some situations, you can let a buyer can let themselves into a house and show themselves the yeah. house. So whether that's a good <laughs> idea or not, <laughs> that's I, a little scary, I think. <laughs> yeah, but but we what we provide if you have a great real estate agent that really mm -hmm. a cares, b knows, and and most real estate agents are 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 working on a higher level than they used to. They're those trusted advisors that can interpret that information for you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, first time advice or advice for a first time home buyer in this in this balanced market. Like, what do you what's your advice for them? It's kind of in the same theme is get some good advisors that can help you. Mm -hmm. um, people, first time home buyers often refer, often rely on mom and dad and mom and dad are good people. It depends how young people are when they're first time home buyers, but they often re rely on mom and dad and mom mm -hmm. and dad are people that you trust. Mm -hmm. um, 
but sometimes don't have the, the knowledge to really help you make a totally informed decision. So a good, I would start with a good mortgage person, a good mortgage specialist that's going to get into your finances. You need to look at your credit store score, figure out if there's any work that needs to be done there. What about your down payment? How much down payment do you need? Do you need a plan to start saving up for that? Um, what does mortgage rate look like for, for at each price point for mortgage payment and don't buy, please don't buy something that you can just barely afford now. Remember that life does take turns and you can potentially get in over your head. But especially if interest rates climb again and you have to renew in your, after your five year term, how's that going to affect you? So interest you rates climb, to... your health changes, your yeah. job changes. When you're young and you're a first time home buyer, you're a fully fledged formed adult. Don't get me wrong, yeah. but you still have a little bit of that. I, at least I did. You still have a little bit of that thinking that life is going to just give you sunshine. Mm -hmm. And you and I are seasoned enough to know that sometimes things go wrong. So just factor that into that decision making. The other thing I would say is get a good mortgage or sorry, get a good real estate person that can help work you through first time home buyers, incentives from the government, and they can help you make a good purchase decision. Location is important. Yes. Buying a house that's not going to give you trouble. Something with good, if it's not brand new, then at least something with really good bones. Um, just making that really solid decision. But I was the kid that drove a Toyota Camry because I <laughs> because I wanted something I could trust. You yeah. Know, instead of buying the the Mustang or, or whatever. So yeah. maybe that's just who I am. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, for first time home buyers or even for experienced home buyers and sellers, what kind of negotiation strategies are we kind of looking at? Being that our market is changing. And we're hitting that more balanced here uh, in our area. How do you think that would affect everybody? Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's about market knowledge. I'm not going to speak specifically about negotiation strategy, but what I would say is, in the market you're purchasing in, go out there and figure out what houses are selling for in in, in relation to the selling price. Yeah. Ask your agent. Ask them what they think you should come in at. Um, but don't hesitate to sort of. Me, I don't. I don't like lowball offers. I don't think that's a good idea, but don't hesitate to sort of make a lower offer than people have been doing recently yeah. in the recent past because that's the market we're starting to go into a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. It may or may not work, but you know, you you uh, you just have to arm yourself with that information. So if a home is generally selling 5,000 below the asking price, you know, you generally want to come in 10,000 below the asking price, that, that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. So we're, just, we're in a market now where there's a little bit more negotiation now yeah. and uh, not just uh, throwing numbers out there and hoping you're the best. Yeah. Um, there's definitely room for that negotiation, especially things that have been sitting on the market for a little bit. You know, um, I think we're seeing a lot more price reductions right now as well. So it's definitely something that you can use in your strategy, looking at houses that have been around for market for some time. And, uh, it's not my to, listings, but it's yeah. not your listings, yeah. <laughs> but my buyers, that's what we're going to do. <laughs> um, so we already kind of talked about global impact, but uh, you know, what are the kind of global impacts kind of can affect our local market? You know, um, we've seen the ongoing wars that are happening over in uh, you know Ukraine and and uh, some unsettling stuff happening um, in yeah. the Middle East. Uh, does that really going to affect us here? Do you think for our local markets? I think the global economy has a massive impact on our local markets. Um, I think it has for, it always has, but it has more so mm -hmm. in the last 10 and 20 years. So, I mean, inflation is the biggest challenge for yeah. us right now. Obviously, that's why the interest rates are high. That's why affordability is becoming uh, an issue. You know, in my opinion, inflation is not necessarily a bad thing. This whole system, this whole capitalist system, for better or for worse, it needs this sort of thing to happen yeah. to make corrections. Real estate prices got too high, and, and um, we're, you know, we're, we're seeing some corrections for that. Can global things like wars, um, you know, I think that what's going on in the Middle East is particularly probably concerning. If mm -hmm. if there is a, a larger war in the Middle East, then that affects oil prices, which affects gas prices, which affects inflation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, th there's an effect, but there's always an effect. There's always a danger that something will happen. Mm -hmm. You know, apparently uh, you can have a pandemic pop out of nowhere. Yeah, apparently, right? Right. <laughs> so. and do, you think, do you think the government has anything to play in that at all that can help? alleviate some of that i you know i don't want to get political but i would say the government has a major role to play in it i mm -hmm. mean inflation monetary policy is what is set by the government and set by so yeah i mean they're the way they handle this situation is going to affect all of us for a long period of time yeah. whether they're they're handling it well or not you know i'll leave that for somebody with a higher pay grade absolutely <laughs> a lot higher than us um anyways yeah so i guess to sort of bring us to a close um last remarks 
What's your single most important advice for a potential buyer or seller or investor? Educate In yourself. This, educate yourself. Educate yourself. Um, don't so too many people come to us and ask us uh, for our opinion of value or our opinion on this. Ask us why. Ask us why your house is worth what mm -hmm. it is. That's a very good question. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Because everyone's going to have a different opinion, but if you can back it up with facts and stats, and you know, it's going to make more weight and what, what you're better saying. Better decisions. Right? You'll make, make better decisions, decisions the more information you have. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's going to wrap it up for today. Uh, once again, my name is Tom Duell. I'm Chris Fenton. And thanks for uh, joining us. Have a great day.